Welcome to the TREAT Interim Results Webinar. I now hand over to Damon Reeve, CEO, and Richard Hope, CFO. Damon, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, and good morning, everybody, and thank you for your interest uh, in TREAT. Uh, we are delighted uh, to uh, report what is a fantastic six months uh, result for the business, a fantastic performance across uh, all key uh, financial uh, metrics and indeed a record uh, performance for the group. Uh, that has not arrived um, easily. There's been an awful lot of uh, hard work and dedication for the team to deliver uh, these numbers in what, of course, has not been an easy time uh, for the world. Uh, but important uh, progress uh, for the business uh, in that period and, and great performance, particularly on, on improvements in gross margin as our mix transitions uh, to a much more uh, added value mix uh, in the business. But across all key financial metrics, we're certainly delighted with, uh, with the six-month results. So taking a rather deeper dive and just to sort of illustrate some of the growth drivers behind the performance in the period. So we split this slide into quadrants. So we start with quadrant one in the top left. So what we're talking about here is we're diversifying our business across what have been quite strongly growing addressable markets for the business. Now, if we start with hard seltzers, which is something we'll take a much deeper dive into during the presentation in terms of a case study. But we, we certainly, hard seltzers themselves, particularly in the US market where most of the growth is being seen, is within market share from unflavoured beer and wine. And if I read recently, if hard seltzers themselves were one single beer, they would be the fourth or fifth biggest selling beer in America now. So it's taken a lot of market share from retail beer uh, in, the, in the US. And we've certainly capitalised uh, on a number of opportunities there, both from existing and indeed new clients, uh, as this uh, be important beverage trend continues to gain uh, traction. The new coffee platform that we've been working on now for some time has provided some very important read across opportunities for us into tea, which is monetized in the period. So this is a new method of extraction of tea for us uh, at Treat, and that's that's delivered some good numbers in the period. And what we're also finding is that pre-COVID trends in beverage, anything that was important pre-COVID is becoming at least as important after COVID. So trends in natural and better for you very much play to treat strengths. And we've seen some good delivery in that respect. So moving to quadrant two, important growth for us of over 57% in tea, health and wellness and our fruit and vegetable categories. And these are categories that are natural, and bringing good differentiating value uh, to our customers. And that remains very important. The beverage market is an important uh, and it's a crowded competitive market space and treats expertise is, enables our customers to differentiate in that crowded market space. Our scientists' expertise in what is a very complex area of sugar reduction in beverage, which remains a very important topic increasingly now across the developed uh, world uh, has performed very well in the period. So there's many opportunities that we're working on today, but have also monetized in, in the first half uh, around sugar reduction. And this is our provision of the authentic flavor and aroma of sugar, but without the calories and the carbohydrates associated with sugar itself. So the team have performed very well in these important categories. Moving to quadrant three, where we talk about citrus, which is our largest segment in the business. We've got some new extraction technology there in citrus, which has certainly fed into the margins in the period. And this new extraction technology enables us to capture great authenticity from the input citrus materials and provide our customers a very authentic and true to nature experience from citrus into the beverage. So that's been an important uh, growth uh, um, a factor in the period and also uh, supporting that drive into more added value. Our raw material markets in citrus have, mu have moved to a much more normalized uh, level. In the past two years, we've seen some weakness uh, in citrus uh, raw material prices, but now we feel they've recovered to a much more uh, typical uh, kinds of levels. And then lastly, investing for future growth in quadrant four. We're delighted 
to say that our new UK headquarters has finally opened its doors and we've got actually staff working from the new headquarters today. We've got a few office staff in, largely taking some opportunity to get some relief from working from home. The plan is to continue that transition over the next few months. And then lastly, manufacturing will transition uh, at the end of uh, 2021 into 2022. But it's a great thing to have the doors open. We've been looking forward to this moment for some time, and it's certainly something that we're very excited about, the upside potential for in the second half and for our longer term future. And we're also further strengthening our management team. There's two new positions that we've uh, recruited, a global chief people officer um, and a global uh, chief innovation officer. We we very much feel that uh, R&D and innovation will be an important factor for our medium to longer term growth and we very much want to capitalise on opportunities in that space. So ESG is something that many of you know is something that's been very important to treat for a number of years. And in fact, we often say to investors that ESG was the way we ran our business before the acronym became uh, commonplace in the investment community. What we want to do in terms of ESG is to build upon the success that we've had to date, but importantly, move beyond our customers' own expectations of us. So we've done a number of things uh, in in the period. We're beginning to put together and embed a very robust ESG strategy in the business. And there's a lot of work that's going on in that regard. But to support that, we've appointed a global sustainability manager who will be coordinating uh, all of our efforts. We're embedding the ESG focus uh, uh, into the business with uh, training videos and and different things to get get this very important uh, matter uh, deeply embedded into the business and to, for it to be the lens that informs all of our thinking across the, across the business. We're, we're working on a number of initiatives. We're looking to report on our scope three emissions and a lot of work going on now uh, in terms of supply chain. But generally on ESG, we feel we're in a good place. But importantly, we want to make further strides. This is too big a subject just to consider we are complete, we're, we're happy with our level. I don't think we can ever be ever be comfortable and content with the level we're at in terms of ESG. I think it's always important that we, uh, that we push forward, uh, particularly around important topics such as climate. And now I hand over to Richard for the numbers. Good morning, everybody. And can I uh, add my thanks to you all for joining us this morning? So this first slide is really showing the context of this year's very strong results and performance so far this year, um, set against the consistent growth in profit before tax that we've had over the last decade. And it also illustrates the updated market guidance that we've put out this morning, where we now uh, expect our profit before tax and exceptional items for the current year to exceed 20 million pounds. It's worth bearing in mind, as as Damon has said, that COVID has had a negative net impact on our results over the last 12 months. So we do see the momentum already in the business being further supported by the return of hospitality in many parts of the world in the second half of our financial year. So turning to the detail of the income statement, revenue was up 13.5%. In constant currency, it was up 16.2%. Most notably, gross profit increased by 51.6%, which was driven by the strong growth in our higher margin, healthier living categories of tea, fruit and vegetables, and health and wellness, and also a material improvement in our citrus margins. And I'll come on to that on the next slide. Administrative expenses were up 34.6%, which was a function of the fact that we now have a full year running rate of our expanded US site coming into our administrative expenses and the full year effect of last year's new hires and some important new hires this financial year in customer facing roles in both sales and technical. Our exceptional costs purely relate to the UK relocation. So these are one-off costs concerning the UK relocation that do not fall to be capitalised. And it's worth noting that our tax rate in the first half was higher than in the previous year. And this is due to 
the country mix with a higher proportion of profits being in the US. So turning to our categories, so our citrus category, and I will explain this further on the next slide, the margin improvement in the citrus category very much reflects the more stable pricing in that category, but more importantly, the increased sophistication of the citrus category. Our tea category, which is one of our three healthier living categories of tea, fruit, vegetable and health and wellness, as I mentioned, had a very, very strong year with growth up 93%. And it's worth bearing in mind that that was compared to a very strong 40% growth in our tea category in H1 last year. And in fact, by the end of last financial year, our tea category was only up 2% as it was one of the most COVID impacted of our categories. Our fruit and vegetables category had another very good year uh, with significant increase in revenue of over 50%. And this category has been growing double digit for a number of years now. So this is the authentic extracts from various fruits and vegetables, as the name suggests, things like passion fruit, cucumber, watermelon, and mango. And those are four, um, four varieties that have done very well in the period. Um, and and that, that, that is uh, one of the categories where we expanded the capacity in the US to meet demand. Our health and wellness category, which is predominantly around the area of sugar reduction, so reducing sugar in beverage particularly, has again performed extremely well with almost 30% growth in revenue. The only category that has fallen slightly in the period is our herbs, spices and florals category. This is a wide range of essential oils. So for example, it includes tea flavors for the Middle East, um, which as you can imagine has been quite COVID impacted. So that category did have a COVID impact, which we expect to unwind over the next six months. And then finally, our synthetic aroma category. This includes, for example, protein substitutes, uh, snack food flavors, or nature identical fragrance ingredients. This continues to perform very well in the marketplace and has been growing very well over the last few years. So looking at our citrus category, we have increasingly refocused that category on higher margin, more sophisticated ingredients. We have invested in new technology to develop a range of water-soluble authentic character extracts. And these are, for example, finding favor in the alcoholic or hard seltzer market that Damon was referring to earlier. So as we continue our plans over the next few years, we see our citrus category becoming a more sophisticated category and a higher margin category as compared to where it was previously. So looking at cash flow, our normalized free cash flow was 3.6 million pounds in the year with an operating cash flow of 12 million offset by a 6 million pound increase in working capital. The working capital increase of 6 million was as expected. We had a 5 million increase in inventories. This is normal at this time of our financial year as we enter the peak beverage season in the Northern Hemisphere. Our normalized free cash flow of 3.6 million, we would typically expect that to be higher in the second half of our financial year. So turning to financial guidance, this is a new slide that we've put out this year. We expect our revenue growth to exceed 14% for the full year, ended 30th September 2021. EBITDA growth to exceed 35%. Our adjusted EPS growth to be slightly lower, at least 30%. This is down to the higher full year tax rate that we are now expecting. And with a further total capex on our UK relocation that we still have to spend of about eight million pounds, we expect our net debt at the financial year end to be at a comfortable range of between six and eight million pounds. So now I'd like to uh, introduce um, a case study uh, into hard seltzers um, as part of our growing uh, addressable uh, market. So first of all, um, let me uh, explain uh, what a brewer might do with a beer. When, so when a brewer makes a beer, a brewer typically has uh, four principal ingredients uh, available and that's water, yeast, hops, and of course, uh, the, the malt. 
Um, so four principal ingredients and a brewer can make a plethora uh, of different beers from those four ingredients. Anything from a light lager uh, through to a, a stout or a porter or something like a, a double dry hot IPA. So a, 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 an enormous range of flavour opportunity that a brewer can make with just four ingredients in a, in a beer. When it comes to uh, seltzers, the ingredient deck is very different in seltzers. It's a much simpler ingredient deck. There's water, alcohol, maybe some preservative system, maybe a, a sweetener system, but it's the natural extract that has to do all of the heavy lifting in terms of flavor sensation, which really does contrast uh, to how a beer is constructed. And it's the natural extract that is provided by treat and companies like treat that, that have to really make the beverage perform in terms of flavor and the consumer perception. And of course, if the beverage performs well, if the brand performs well, uh, it often results in repeat opportunities for us at Treat. Now, we've got a lot of expertise around the provision of natural extracts, and they lend themselves very well to alcoholic hard seltzers. So a high-performing natural extract, which customers are buying from Treat, really do all the work in terms of the performance of that beverage and also the performance of that brand in the market. So we're seeing some important growth here uh, in, this, uh, in this growing market, which is taking a lot of retail uh, share away from retail beer in the US. But we're beginning to see this transition now coming to the UK market uh, and also parts of, parts of Europe as well. And we expect that transition to continue. It's largely driven by uh, consumers uh, wanting an alcoholic beverage, but increasingly uh, with a consciousness around the calorific content of that beverage. So something something very refreshing, something authentic, which we're, again, very good at bringing that authenticity to beverage, but with a mind uh, for uh, a reduced sugar or reduced calorie uh, beverage for the, uh, for the, for the social media uh, generation, uh, if, if I can say that. So... Great uh, opportunities for us. We've, we've seen it feed into our numbers strongly in the second half. Uh, happily, we, we work with a number of uh, the leading brands in this, in this space, but also many new brands also come into market, and that's presented a uh, treat with a lot of opportunity uh, in this place. And an important um, uh, diversification within the category of hard seltzers, which is fed into the numbers in the period, has been uh, alcoholic hard seltzer iced tea, uh, where we provide uh, a number of different tea extracts to support that growth in, the, in that segment of beverage. So alcoholic iced tea is becoming a, a, an important growth trend uh, in the US market. I'm not sure if it's going to directly translate to the UK market, but we'll see what happens uh, uh, in the future. But nevertheless, uh, in important uh, consumer markets such as the US, it's performed uh, very well, and we see further opportunity uh, in that space as well. So there's a number of different categories uh, that we have at Treat that can inform the uh, alcoholic hard seltzer market, and uh, there's there's a number of opportunities there for us in citrus and fruit and vegetable extracts. But we're also finding that some of our sugar reduction technology provides an important boost. Uh, to the flavour uh, in the in the in the iced tea, so the natural extract performance in the iced tea is often boosted by the use of our sugar reduction solution to provide that pop, as uh, my American colleagues would call it, into the beverage. So beverage performance particularly important, but unlike a beer, the natural extract has to do all of the heavy lifting in terms of the flavour, and therefore customers are prepared to pay for high quality, authentic natural extracts, and that's very much a core strength of treat. So in terms of other beverage trends that are going on uh, in the marketplace, we, we want to put this slide together really to explain what it is the consumer uh, wants today. And certainly authenticity around beverage is particularly important, that premiumization, that true to nature flavor, that natural extract they buy from treat, they want it to be real, they want it to be recognizable, and we've got some excellent technology uh, that allows us to provide those solutions uh, to our customers. Certainly, the health agenda is not going away, and increasing awareness around calorific content of 
uh, beverage, and also trends into low and no alcohol products that we are playing quite a strong hand in in terms of those developments. And we're working on some interesting uh, projects uh, around replication, for example, of the burn of alcohol in a non-alcoholic beverage, just to give that sensation uh, that the drink is as close to its alcoholic equivalent as it can be. Convenience has become, of course, a critical factor in the last 12 months when we think about the closure of the on-trade, of the market there, the on-trade, and the switch to the retail market has been really important. So convenience products, retail channels have been very important. And as we look to the future, we are optimistic about the return of the on-trade, of hospitality demand picking up once again. And we're starting to feel that return now. And we certainly welcome the announcement by the UK government yesterday. And increasingly across our marketplace, we look forward to return of hospitality and the upside potential we feel that will bring the business. Premiumization is also another very important trend in beverage. And we see uh, good opportunities there, again, from our higher margin added value portfolio. So any trend we see really in beverage around the world, uh, we feel we're very placed to provide important relevance to our customers, provide that differentiating solution that can help our customers' product perform in the market, their brand perform in the market. And as a result of that, we get a lot of repeat business and further opportunities. And it's those further opportunities that are really well demonstrated in this slide, where we talk about our partnership model with our customers. We very much enjoy co-development of solutions with our customers, and that, that enables us to get very close to our customers uh, and have a very deep relationship, which, which results uh, in almost all cases in a lot of repeat opportunity and a lot of repeat business. So the, the table on the left-hand side of this slide shows uh, our top 10 customers. And in each case, uh, all of our top 10 customers have been with us, uh, been a customer of Treat for at least a decade, and in many cases, several decades. And as you can see, the number of categories that we supply our customers, in the vast majority, we supply a large number of different uh, categories. So we've widened our footprint in terms of our top 10 customers, but also, we're busily onboarding new customers as beverage particularly continues to innovate and the supermarket shelf becomes a very interesting place in terms of innovation with new products coming to market. We're looking after our existing customers very strongly and also coveting new customers. And certainly some of, that, some of those new customer wins have fed into the numbers uh, in the first half of the year. So now, happily, uh, we can talk in very positive terms about our UK site relocation, which many of you would have heard about uh, for some time. Um, the last time we spoke at the four-year results, we talked about the construction being complete. But as I mentioned earlier, today we can talk about colleagues actually working on site as we continue the manufacturing uh, fit out, which we expect to continue now for a good few months to come. Uh, is certainly progressing uh, very well. And the reaction from, from our colleagues uh, who, have, who are working from our new facility has been fantastic. Uh, I was there uh, two weeks ago uh, myself, uh, seeing uh, some colleagues and seeing the reaction of colleagues uh, to, to the new facility. And it's, it's really fantastic. And we're enormously excited about welcoming customers to the new site. It really does lend itself, reflects brilliantly the treat that we've become today. Very much the business we are. We've got sites literally at the front end of the building, as the next images uh, will show. Uh, we're, we're, we're very excited about what this will bring the business in terms of the image of treat. Now, I'm sure some of you have visited our current facilities uh, in the UK, and you'll recognize now the uplift uh, that you see on the slides uh, in front of you. So on the left-hand side here, these are some of the benches, some of the laboratories where we will be working with our customers to co-develop solutions uh, to beverage. And it's a, it's a fantastic environment for customers to work in. Certainly our sales team are very excited uh, to bring customers to our new facility. But as the other images show also, there's a, there's a huge uplift in terms of the 50-year-old facility that we've been working out, out of now for the, in the UK. And you know, it's, a, it's an amazing space uh, for colleagues, for customers to come and visit, 
and indeed to enhance the culture that we're very proud of within the business. I think, you know, we've got a great opportunity here. I think the team have done a tremendous job to get us into this position. We're, we're delighted with, with the design and the execution. And that's before we move to uh, the, the numerous operational efficiencies that will come from the new site, such as automated warehousing, you see on the left-hand side here, an uplift in laboratories. And we've got a lot of computer-controlled and digitized manufacturing still to come on stream. And we look forward to that coming on stream across the rest of uh, 2021 into the first part of 2022. So an enormous uplift for the business, big potential. And I think it really does uh, do treat proud. The business that we've become today, and finally, we've got the physical infrastructure, which I think really does reflect uh, who we are today to give us the scale to grow uh, and realise the opportunities that, that we've got in-house. So it's uh, I look forward to uh, welcoming you uh, when we're allowed, uh, when COVID rules permit, to come and visit us uh, in, in various areas and come and see for yourself the, the facility and the business that we've become today. So turning then to current trading and outlook, clearly we're delighted not just to produce a set of upgraded numbers for the year, but we're excited about the momentum that we see now building as we move into the second half of the year. We do expect um, and are beginning to feel a resumption of demand coming from on-trade channels and hospitality channels, which, uh, of course, are very important. And we do expect to be uh, net beneficiaries of that. Our China subsidiary, our wholly owned foreign enterprise, is due to uh, open later this financial year, and we're certainly very encouraged by a number of the beverage opportunities that we have in China and how China is indeed and the team there are performing today. Health trends, driving growth in higher margin categories we expect to continue. And that's a very strong hand for the business. We think we've got some good prospects in that case. And as I mentioned earlier, strengthening the management team to support future growth. You know, we're gearing the business up uh, for the next uh, phase of, of transition and we'll continue uh, to, to build on that. And currently, certainly the board is optimistic uh, that, the, uh, that the current strong momentum will continue and will result in the PBT uh, before tax and exceptional items for the current year uh, of at least £20 million, which uh, exceeds the existing market expectations before today of £18 million. So fantastic work by the team, fantastic progress. And um, yeah, I think we're, we're ready for questions. Thanks very much. And we'll go to Charles Hall from Peel Hunt. Thank you. Morning, Damon. Morning, Richard. Morning, Charles. Uh, I've got a few questions on uh, revenue growth. Um, so I'll, I'll ask them in turn, let you answer them rather than giving you a whole long list. Uh, firstly, the 14% growth that you've talked about, or over 14%, uh, just to confirm, is that in constant currency? Uh, no, that's in um, that that's in reported r reported. Um, the, difficult to judge what the FX effect will be in H two, Charles. Um, obviously, there was a, a, a um, just under three percent difference between reported and and constant currency in 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 the first half of the financial year. Um, broadly, um, a stronger dollar um, would. Re result in a, a higher constant currency growth so obviously at the moment sterling is is strengthening against the dollar so that three percent may disappear so i've just assumed it in in reported currency terms lovely uh next one um in the rest of the world sales those were down 23 percent in the first half what, what was behind that um, part of it was the sale of low margin commoditized citrus uh, in, in the previous year, and some of it was just timing and shipment. Sometimes we have global customers who um, order their um, product in different parts of the world. So there was just a shift in terms of where they were all going from. And so um, second half expect to be sort of more in line with second half of last year, just as a sort of Rough guide, uh, maybe that's yeah. No, bit. as a rough guide, that's fair because most of the, particularly the commoditized citrus, was in H one last year. Yeah, got it. Um, and then um, 
probably a difficult question to answer, but obviously you had an impact from COVID on a couple of your categories, um, but you've obviously produced strong results anyway. H have you got a feel for how much that headwind was, say, over the last 12 months? It, it's it's a difficult question to answer, Charles. You're absolutely right. It's it's um, it's hard to say. I think consumer behaviour has changed so much. It's also clouded the, uh, the the picture further in terms of where and how consumers are consuming beverage. It, it is difficult to feel that. What we do know, uh, and what we do feel, is that consumers typically consume more away from home than they do at home, and therefore the return of uh, hospitality. Uh, entertainment generally travel uh, should give us a net upside uh, against uh, against the success we've had uh, in the last 12 months in retail for example but it's it is difficult to feel that with any level of precision uh, other than uh, the sort of information that we have in the business from our sales team and the and the weight of demand that we're feeling at the moment which is definitely we're definitely in a very strong period it would normally be uh, the season will be stronger period of the year, but we're definitely seeing some strength in the numbers right now. And is it fair to say that your gross margin on products that go into hospitality on average are higher than into retail? No, I don't, um, I don't think you can uh, draw that conclusion, Charles. Um, our margins tend to be driven by the category of product. So you've got the healthy living products that, that are higher, higher margin than, say, the synthetic aroma. OK. And, and then last question, Damon, you talked about growth opportunities. Can you just flesh that out a little bit in terms of uh, whether this is coming through in um, new customer wins or cross sell opportunities or just new products um, being developed? And, and where do you see the biggest opportunity set in in which category would you see the the biggest revenue opportunity well we 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 continue to be um encouraged by the opportunities that we see for us uh, in tea and indeed coffee and i think the the, the coffee platform for us has been uh, has has had pleasingly uh, slightly unintended consequential benefits in our tea category because we have expanded our T portfolio, and that's certainly fed into the numbers in the first half, and we expect that to uh, weigh into the numbers in the, in the second half also and, and beyond. So I think certainly the, the better for you uh, type categories such as that give us some uh, some upside potential. But we're we're excited by we're excited by T, but but frankly, you know, the performance in the first half gives us encouragement in, in all in all in all of our categories. Uh, we, we're feeling you know, pretty pretty bullish about the performance uh, that the team have delivered, and they've done a fantastic job in in, in the first half, and and certainly we're we're encouraged by performance to date in the second half. That's brilliant. That's all my questions. Thanks very much. And um, we'll go to Nicola Mallard from Investec. Perfect. Thank you. Morning, guys. A um, couple from me. Um, I'll do them in the same way as Charles, if that's helpful. Um, Citrus, um, you said about improved pricing. You may have already answered this, actually, Richard, um, but uh, Citrus revenues were unchanged overall, and yet pricing was up. So one assumes volume was down. Was that that low margin Citrus business that was in the first half? Um, so that's number one. Uh, yes, that, 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 that's absolutely correct. And I think what's important about the Citrus category is as we move um, to more sophisticated um, areas, we, we get higher margins, but not always uh, higher volumes as well. Perfect, thank you. Um, second question is China on your wholly owned enterprise. I just wondered if you could give us a, an idea of why having your own business out there makes a difference. How have you been selling to date? Have you been doing it through an agent or a distributor? Um, and you know what might that mean, obviously, when you, you go into your own um, unit? Well, I think it will, it will certainly enable us to get a lot closer to the to, the, to our customer base. There, we've, we've been we've been selling thus far through a representative office, um, and we've got we've got a fantastic team there that have done some done some very good things. A representative office, some sales teams, some administrative staff, uh, and some importantly some technical staff. But I think um, to to enable Treat China to uh, 
uh, to sell directly to customers, I think will, will be quite important. I think that that local uh, that local ability, uh, not just around the technical nuances around uh, beverage flavors for China, but also our, our own ability to treat China's own ability to sell, I think will will enhance the relationship with the customer. I think that I think that will bring some uh, important um, opportunities. I mean, we we feel very confident about uh, the opportunities that present uh, that present as to us in China and. The, the, the team there have been working very hard for now a, n- a number, a long period of time to cultivate these important relationships. And I think we're on the point now where we can begin to monetize those in a, in a meaningful way. And we see China emerging as an important uh, uh, geography for us behind North America, but certainly, you know, making progress. Um, be you know in the, in the sort of mid teens uh, going forward in terms of revenue in the medium term, uh, we we certainly see the the growing demand uh, for healthier beverages in China for innovation in beverage in China, bringing us uh, a lot of opportunities. So it's certainly something that's very important for the business, and it's an important next step we're making. Okay, so the people that you've got in that representative office will transfer into your wholly owned enterprise. So those relationships you've been cultivating just continue, yeah? They will, yes. Yeah. And finally from me, um, new site, um, capacity in terms of production. I'm sure you've answered this before, but if you could remind us just what uh, new site does versus old site on um, absolute capacity. Thanks. Yeah, so um, our, our, this was not, ne- never was a capacity constrained uh, project. This is much more of a business transformation project, Nicola. So we're not running at capacity at our old UK site, but it's very inefficient the usage of capacity at our old UK site. So if, if our old site is about maybe at 50 to 60% capacity, we would expect to be able to at least treble that at the new UK site uh, once it's fully fully up and running. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, guys. And we'll go to Cathal Kenny at Davy. Good morning, gents, uh, and congrats on, on the half. A couple of questions for me. Uh, firstly, on the hard seltzer market, have you done any work in terms of looking at the addressable market for extracts, natural extracts within the hard sensor complex in North America. That's my first question. Second question is on routes to market. Just wondering, would you could you provide some color on route to market growth by flavor houses versus direct? Uh, third question is on citrus. Just the if you look at your overall citrus revenue base, and just interested to know what percentage of that is value add as you define it. Um, those three, and I have one more to follow up. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Carl. Uh, th- thanks for these questions. I think the the it's a good question around the addressable market in terms of the hard seltzer market and 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 the provision of natural extracts. I'm going to unfortunately give you a slightly disappointing answer. It is very hard uh, to be precise. What what we do know is in some of the of course some of the higher uh, higher performing um, higher more premiumized uh, hard seltzers. There's definitely a strong weighting towards natural, authentic extracts that provide that important differentiation. But there is also a a growing trend um, around uh, the use of cheaper and often synthetic flavors uh, in in emerging brands as well. And and it's often quite hard to be uh, precise. I mean, the, the, the doses would vary. And the addressable market is also growing so rapidly. It is, it is it is hard to be hard to be precise. What I can say is that we are not short of opportunity in this space. We've we've made some very good progress, and the team have done a very great job to execute on the, those opportunities. But we do have a number of uh, opportunities in front of us that we're keen to uh, to monetize in the second half and beyond. But we we do see this trend continuing to grow. Market data supports uh, continued growth now for two or three years. And that's just in the US market. That's before it really gains a foothold uh, internationally, which is beginning to happen uh, in a a rather slow way. But we expect that to accelerate as economies uh, open up and and, and scale um, moves in. Uh, But it it is the case, though, that the market is, is growing rapidly. 
Uh, many brands seem to come to market every week, uh, and some of those newer brands that come into market are certainly uh, talking to us about, uh, about helping them uh, position themselves in the marketplace if they're after the more premium end uh, of the market where we can provide our natural extracts. That's certainly the sweet spot uh, that we like to play. Yeah, and, and just turning to our routes to market, Carl, um, this is a very important part of what's driving our growth. Our ability to access a number of leading brands in, in particular um, beverage genre has been a, a significant growth driver. So, in fact, um, our revenue uh, from uh, flavor and fragrance, as opposed to FMCG and other routes, is about 57% is going into flavor and fragrance. So, you can see from that that our growth with companies that now describe themselves as taste and nutrition is actually very strong. In terms of uh, what proportion of citrus is value add, there are degrees of value add, but the high end value add within citrus is about 20 to 30 percent. There's another 20 percent that kind of sits in the middle. And then there are the byproducts that are necessarily generated as a result of citrus extract processes. Very good, very good. A couple of follow-up questions. Firstly, if we look at the order book, uh, which um, is obviously uh, in a great, in great health, I'm just wondering in terms of the, the makeup of that, new customers versus existing customers. And my final question just on overall growth, it's a hard question, I guess. Would you have any sense of the, the share of new products? These are actually new products that were created in the last 12 months. Uh, with regard to just the overall revenue piece or the growth piece? Broadly speaking, over 90% of our order book it relates to existing customers. When new customers come in, they often come either with initial product launches or trial orders. So they tend to be at a smaller scale. The, the, the largest part of our order book will be um, uh, uh, orders with existing customers either for new products or for existing products and and some of that growth is higher orders with existing products uh, as well so so it's very much um, uh, existing customers you, you see that from the partnership model where our top 10 customers are, have been existing customers for uh, a long time uh, I, I would I would say on the on the new product question, Within the period, it's somewhere between three and five percent of our revenue would be uh, new products, which is a good performance uh, in in the period, frankly, in, in terms of growth opportunities. And some of that, some of those new products, as I mentioned earlier, read across opportunities from our coffee extraction platform into tea, for example, where uh, we're providing a different type of tea extract for certain uh, beverage markets. But certainly, we we are committed. Uh, to drive in increasing revenue from new product development. And, that, and that's the reason that we're bringing in a uh, chief innovation officer to um, very much get behind on a global basis. Uh, that growth for the future is something that we're, that, we, that we're absolutely committed to do. And we want to see um, performance from new products increase. And we're committed to back that um, as our business grows in terms of our spend on R&D. Great. Thanks for the colour. And um, we'll go to Sarah Welford from Edison. Hi, morning, gentlemen. Um, I have a couple of questions, which, uh, first of all, in terms of citrus prices, um, can you tell us what, sort of broadly what you expect over the next 12 to 24 months? I mean, obviously, we've seen quite a lot of turbulence in the market over the last two years or so, and uh, where you see that going over the next one to two years. And uh, in terms of uh, your, the, the new product development pipeline, um, how much can you quantify it all? How much of a pickup you are seeing in customer demand as lockdown restrictions ease? I, I know that's probably hard, but uh, can you give any kind of quantification? Thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Sarah. Um, first of all, in terms of, in terms of citrus, I think the, over the, overarching, the overarching answer to that is that you know, we, we strongly feel that we've decoupled our dependency now on movements in citrus raw material prices having a material impact uh, on our business. And we, we put some slides in the pack a couple of years ago, which really explains how we very much transitioned the business away from that sort of trading company past where there used to be those bigger influences. 
But at 45% of the business, of course, there is some impact in terms of raw material input costs. And you know, we have moved now to um, what, I, what I consider much more normalized uh, levels of input prices. And we see, I mean, we do see some firming um, in, the, in the next 12 months, particularly around orange oil, which is our biggest raw material input. That's likely to, I think, firm, firm a little more, but I think prices will be broadly stable uh, on 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 citrus, and so if we want to take a deeper dive, I think on on lemon and lime, they're likely to uh, increase a little further. Um, that's that, that's very, and it's just a factor, of course, of, of, of crops and different growing origins uh, around the world. But what I what I feel will happen uh, is that at tree, as Richard mentioned earlier, now our focus is very much on the added value uh, end of that market, bringing important, authentic differentiators to our to our customers. So. Our own thinking really is sort of decoupling uh, from those uh, raw material input costs. But nevertheless, we have a very skilled and experienced team who keep a very close eye on that kind of uh, um, impact uh, from the from the supply chain. Uh, I think it, it, in terms of your other question about the the, the growth in um, uh, what we see in terms of the pipeline as hospitality uh, reopens, it is very difficult to quantify. Uh, to, to, to be honest, a lot of the opportunities we're working on have um, uh, equal opportunity in retail and hospitality. Uh, and then really it's down to our customers in terms of where they apportion those. But what we are seeing, though, is definitely a resurgence in interest from our customers to, to think about new product development. And that's that's happening on quite a rapid scale. I think as optimism uh, increases uh, around the world. Uh, in terms of coming out of, of lockdowns and hospital, hospitality resuming, uh, I think there's going to be a, an interesting marketplace, uh, shall we say, uh, come the summer, one would hope, uh, if things continue to uh, progress. Okay, thank you. And we'll go to Charles Hall from Peel Hunt. Thank you. Can I just ask about admin costs? Uh, obviously, it went up a, a decent chunk in the period. Some of that is just annualisation plus... Uh, some investment, as you've talked about, in, in new people. But thinking on a longer term basis, do you want to just provide some colour as to how you're expecting to, to grow the cost side in order to continue growing the business? Maybe putting it either in terms of number of heads or percent of sales or uh, resources that you still require? In America, we see a significant increase in uh, front and back back-end uh, operational staff, as well as customer-facing um, staff, as we're expanding capacity significantly there. You'll have seen that we've bought a further six acres of land, so we do expect to see further expansion in the States. Um, in the UK, I think we're going to see much more of a steady state in terms of uh, people. I think we're going to see more customer-facing roles um, but I think that the operational efficiencies will mean that uh, the operational headcount will grow a lot slower than our revenue growth. But we, we would sensibly expect to see uh, double-digit admin expense growth over the next two or three years, certainly. I think it's, it's, it's firepower in front of customers that we're looking for. And that can yeah. be... Um, that can be sort of a, a science-based people or indeed salespeople, but we're, we're in a strong growth uh, phase at Treat, which is, I think, you know, obviously quite, quite evident. And we want to support that. We've got to make sure that we, that we continue to invest in the right headcount, bring the people into the culture of the business, which, of course, is fantastic. Um, but I think, you know, we're, we're not going to be slow to bring in uh, uh, expertise in the business that can help us propel us even further forward. Clearly, we're We've, we've, we've built some, um, we've built an expanded facility in the US. We've, we've got a fantastic opportunity now in the UK uh, to really impress uh, global customers and we want to maximize the opportunity that that gives us. And, and just following up on that US point in terms of the um, new development, can you just remind us of the costs of that, the additional capacity and the timing that it'll take? Probably every two or three years at our current rate of growth, we would see about $6 million of 
plant and machinery um, being needed to increase capacity for our healthier living categories. Um, in addition, at some point in the next five years, we would expect about $10 million of infrastructure spend um, as we need more storage space and to widen our, our manufacturing footprint uh, at the U US site generally. So those are the key uh, big ticket items in the US. The UK, um, obviously having made this complete sort of greenfield site uh, expansion, we have um, the ability to double the size of every aspect of the new site, but we certainly don't see any of that being needed within the next five years. And, and that $10 million infrastructure spend in the US will kick off when? Um, we haven't got exact plans around that yet. We literally only completed on the land about um, two weeks ago, Charles, but um, we would probably be looking at about two to three years from now. Um, if we grow faster and we need it sooner, then then obviously we will accelerate that. But that is roughly where we would see that from. Perfect. Thanks. And um, we'll go to Damien McNeela from Numis. Hi. Morning, gents. Morning. Mm -hmm. A few questions here. Um, hard sales has seemed to be a feature of a number of different categories. I was wondering, are you able to sort of break out how much hard sales has contributed to group growth in either revenue or profit terms, please? I think what we can say, Damien, is that last year, um, hard seltzers, and we don't always know, and this is the important point about our routes to market, because we, we, we uh, believe we're in a number of the leading brands, but some of them are indirect and some of them are direct. But last year, we uh, estimate that um, revenue uh, that is related to the hard seltzer market was somewhere between 10 and 15%, and that may now be north of 15% in the current in the first six months of our current financial year. Right, okay. Um, and then just a question on guidance. Um, if, if you look at the sort of your H1, H2 splits over there, I think you put it on there for the last period of time. I know the guidance says, um, I think it's at least tw tw 20 million. Yeah. I was just wondering what, and you sort of, You've been very clear that you expect lots of growth opportunities and there's a clear tailwind from on trade reopening. I was just wondering, is there anything in there that sort of could drag the numbers back? Because it feels like the second half should be pretty strong and should be stronger than the first half that you delivered. Is, is there anything that we should be sort of thinking about that sort of pulls that back a bit? I think it's a, a fair question, Damien. I mean, in most years, the H1, H2 split, split is about 48, 52. Last year, it was more 40, 60. So, um, so last year was a bit of an anomaly there. Um, I think what we feel is that there is still quite a lot of uncertainty out there. We've had a very strong um, first, eight, uh, first half of our financial year. And I think, you know, you know us, Damien, we, we are cautious. We would rather update the market when something is nailed on um, then be you know bullish in our in our outlook. I think I think that's right, Richard. I think the, the point is consumer behaviour is probably more unpredictable now than it's ever been, uh, certainly in the last many decades. And we and we and we just want to feel what it looks like as hospitality does reopen and people get back to what the new normal or whatever one wishes to call it. But certainly you know across the summer, which is always a peak an important time for the business. We just have to see what consumer behaviour looks like in, in terms of the demand on tree. Yeah, no, okay, that's very clear. And then just one very last one from me. Um, the balance sheet looks to be in pretty decent shape. And I know you sort of highlighted um, sort of future investment plans in the US, but what are the board's thoughts around uses of funds given where the sort of the balance sheet is? What are the priorities, please? So, um, a good question, Damien. So in terms of capital allocation, um, so if I start with dividends, we have a policy of, of aiming towards a dividend cover of two to two and a half times over a rolling three-year basis. Our dividend cover at the moment is, is, is higher than that because we've been going through the capital investment program. Our next priority is to continue investing in our organic growth. Pretty much all the growth 
uh, over the last decade has been organic. We bought one company, Earthall, which we subsequently sold, if you remember. And we, so, uh, you know, there is, there are, our significant returns that we are able to generate by investing in our own growth. Beyond that, Damon and I have always said that we wanted to successfully execute the UK relocation. At the time we announced it, it was the biggest thing that Trees had ever done. Um, we've got a lot of the execution risk, but not all of the execution risk behind us. Um, we've got the transition to the new site, which has started, and we, we're we're going to be moving operations across the new site over the next year. Once that is behind us, then we will always uh, be looking at uh, ways to accelerate our growth. And if there are bolt-on acquisitions that either meet a need geographically or in terms of new technology, then we would certainly consider that as part of our allocation of capital. Okay, that's very clear. Thanks, Richard. And I'm afraid we've run out of time. Damon, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, other than to say thanks very much for your time, everybody, today and your interesting treat. We, we really appreciate uh, the, the opportunity and uh, anything we can do for you in the future. Um, we certainly look forward to welcoming everybody to our new UK uh, headquarters uh, in due course. And uh, have a good day, everybody. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone.